thanks for listening. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to We Say Things, episode 229. Hundred, sorry. 229, Suns fan here with Cinderin. And uh, we may or may not have a new and improved style to the podcast, Cinderin. And it's not me standing up right now. Let me get my thing for my feet, actually. How are you? I'm, I'm good, Shannon. Oh, this, look, this looks good. I love the horse. Thank oh, you. Man. Uh, so. Your camera is sick. Oh, is it following me? Yeah. And by that, it, I mean it's nauseous from you just leaning over to the other side. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this episode, we are testing out a new UI, let's call it. And of course, I didn't even tell Cinderin about this. This is something that I said I wanted to do. Did I say that at the beginning of the year? It was like a New Year's resolution that we're gonna, I was going to do something new for the podcast. I don't think you did, no. Okay. Well, uh, of course, Nikki made this for us. It's a new overlay system. Our webcams nice. for, the, for the audio listeners out there. Webcam is much smaller for both of us, which I know many people will be very happy about. Uh, <laughs> but in addition, uh, we're going with kind of a new age tab system. So basically, I just have a browser, and for each topic, I have some tab that I go to, and you can see it visually. So for the YouTubers, people watching the video, it's going to be much more interactive, let's say. Um, and yeah, not just us. Like if we're talking about literally anything, whether it's even if it's not Dota related, you'll be seeing like articles or whatever on the screen. So I think it will help with the reception uh, of the show. Hopefully, we'll see. Send her in. Very nice. Very happy to have you here. The only issue is, of course, I have four monitors as normal person would. Right now, I, I have to figure out a different way to do this because your webcam is on my far left screen. So I'm looking at okay. you like this. Wait, the webcam follows me though, doesn't it? It's actually kind of nice. Okay. You okay? What do you mean your webcam follows you? If you turn your head, your head is still in the same place. It's just turned. Or do you walk to another room to look at your fourth monitor? I'm going to look at you like this. <laughs> okay. That's good. Anywho, uh, we have some patrons to thank. Thank Ooh, you yes. to our beautiful patrons, including Dear Mr. Gaben, please bring T.I. to Brazil next. Yours truly, Captain Broccoli. STGC Daniel, humbled bookmaker, recommends Relic Arena. Wife heard Pyrian's Belch, now divorced. <laughs> Pepper Balls, T. Coil, Lab Dota. Yatoro does it against Cinderin. Magdev, Disco Farm D, The Megapope, Zan Xavier, and Th Nate Thicko, Zero One Ham Scroats. And Shark TM, Janie, Dop, nothing to see here. Je suis ivre Ben Broomhead loves the NBA segment, wooden aftertaste, anonymous, and Uranus is the only planet in our solar system that spins on its side, Mr. Niebling. No, your now, anus. I just want to say, I just want to say, I'm really proud that considering this is the episode that follows April 1st, that this was actually a Uranus fact and not some fucking joke about Uranus, which you, of course, made after five seconds. <laughs> But good job, Mr. Niebling. It is indeed possible to talk about the planet without making anal jokes. That's I'm because really proud of you. Niebling is European. If he was American, he would have made the anus joke. Just saying. Okay. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I don't know, don't know either. I would. No. I'm going to go with bad. Okay. So we do have a bit of a light episode in Dota. So I have a triple header. Suns fan recommends Cinderin. Are you excited? Oh, baby, is one of them basketball? No, not well. I would not recommend watching the Suns this year. That's no, a Suns fan I, I not think, recommends. I think you should do a Suns fan recommends where you need to convince people that basketball is a good sport. So you need to talk <laughs> about the positives of the sport. No. Okay. Not happening. So first, I have been playing a new game. So a lot oh. of these. So first of all, these recommends. It's not like these are like, you know, unknown mediums. Let's call them. Everybody has heard of all of these, I'm sure. Well, two of the three at least. I don't care. I don't play new games generally. Helldivers 2, Cinderin. I have been playing it. And it yep. has been fantastic. I heard it's really good. I haven't played the game yet. So I, I, I never even heard of Helldivers, like the original. Apparently it was a 
had a top-down view, so it wasn't even a first-person shooter, which is interesting that they've transitioned to that. Mm. But I have to say, and I know that apparently there's a lot of server issues or something when it first came out, but I haven't really experienced that myself. Maybe it's because I didn't play it right away. But I have been very pleasantly surprised uh, by the experience. So I what guess... What do you play with? I played, I played with Nikki mostly. It's a, typically a four-man mm. party, so it's her and then a couple of friends. We kind of switch them around every now and then. Um, but so the TLDR for people that have never played it, it's a squad based game, first person shooter. Well, not first, but it's third person, I guess, but it's a shooter and mm. you go to different planets trying to, uh, it's essentially the, the lore behind it, which they do a really good job in just the tutorial alone setting the, the theme it's humans versus another race. So there's two races so far in the game. There's one is the robots, which everybody hates fighting against. And then the other one is bugs. So okay. uh, the thing, it's going to sound weird. The thing that has impressed me the most with the game is going to sound like such a game design nerd fact is there. So a normal game, when you're matchmaking, you're getting in a party mm -hmm. with people. Let's just say Dota. You open up the Dota client. You add people to your party. It's just text on the screen. And you hit the Q button and you go. It's multiplayer, obviously, mm -hmm. but even if it was single player, it would be similar because you're with a party. They have taken that, and I'm not saying this is completely unique that no other game has done this, but I think they've just done such a seamless job. I create my own ship when I first start the game, right? So I have a ship and I name mm -hmm. it, and people join my ship. So as part of the party system, they're actually joining physically on my ship. They can walk around it, and they can upgrade stuff uh, for themselves within the ship. I can upgrade the ship myself uh, when I'm on it. And then when we're ready to queue, I go to uh, like this HUD screen where my a guy's looking over a screen. I pick which mission we want to take, and then we get in our little pods and we drop away. And so it means that the game actually starts when you join the party. Yes, okay, essentially. So there's like no downtime. So that's nice. the UI system yeah. is mm -hmm. it's the game, which is fucking cool. The way they've transitioned that, and it it feels very immersive because even if you're going from one system to another, you can actually see out the viewport, like really in the, the front of the ship. And you can see other ships. Those are actual people that are docked in the same planet as you. It's, it's really, oh. really cool, I have to say. But, but there's no PvP, right? No, not it's just, at the it's moment. It's atmosphere. Yeah, okay. Yes, PvE. Uh, but yeah, I've been... I haven't paid other... I mean, the monetization's a bit... Not my favorite, and I know Dota people are very picky on their free-to-play game well, it's not a free-to-play but on their games in terms of how they monetize typically if you're like for me i'm old school if i buy a game for like 50 bucks or whatever i expect to not have to buy anything other than maybe dlc later on this game right. you pay 50 bucks for it you can play and you can grind most of the stuff i think maybe all of it uh, over time or you can spend money on the battle pass to get and it's not just cosmetics it actually has uh, in-game effects so like they have a stratagem system where uh, it's almost like a little, you're playing, like back in the day when you had those controller or in like console games, you had these little codes like left, right, forward, left, A, B, whatever. It has like some effect. This one is like you add in a, it's not a nuke, but essentially just an airplane dropping a shit ton of bombs, but you have to type in a little code as you're in the game, like fighting mm -hmm. monsters. It's really cool the way they did things. Uh, but yeah, I would highly, highly recommend this. I should have shown some screenshots, I guess. That would have been more immersive there we go new system we're, we're working <laughs> yep. on it. beta testing the system these are the bugs as you can see <laughs> and the robots uh yeah i should have definitely done this a lot earlier they're just talking again just you know oops okay this, i'm using edge for this by the way microsoft edge not a normal browser that i use uh but yeah oh highly highly recommend this game so go buy and go play all right and I know this is me talking a lot sooner, but we really have nothing to talk about. <laughs> that's good. Now we've we've got we've got some stuff. Don't worry. But this uh, okay. I mean, I can say if you think we can good. talk for a good amount of time, I can save these for another time. No, I'm just thinking the next thing you're going to recommend. I think you've recommended twice already. No, but we can hear it a third time. <laughs> the gentleman. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've recommended this twice. So the gentleman was a movie that I recommended in the past. Oh. This is based off the same... I mean, it's not the same story, but it's made by the same guy. Uh, it's a TV show on Netflix. Ten episodes. Called The Gentleman. Called The Gentleman. 
Wow, he really has no... Okay, it's already to begin with, it's a pretty fucking boring title. <laughs> and then he reruns it as a TV show. All right, I'm going to... Sh <laughs> this title says nothing. It's like there's men in this show. Yeah, because cool. it's, it's Guy Ritchie. So if you like his movies, his style, then you're going to like this. So if you liked In Bruges, then you will like the movie called The Gentleman, and you like the TV series called The Gentleman. I don't even okay. need to explain what the storyline is, but it's gangsters in the UK, which I love the accents that they like the UK has. I think it's maybe my favorite uh, spread of accents, if you want to call it that. Like you got yeah. the Pyrian Flax accent, you have the barely British accent, oh. you have the Cockney accent. Just can't get better than that. But this show oh, is that the show where good. the bloody chicken chase the thing you keep He's saying. He's a fucking a chicken chaser. Yeah, but. This, is that actually from that show? No, this that's from Fable, oh, okay. a, a video game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, you'll know if you like it after one episode. Highly recommend it. And then the third thing, Cinderin, is the three body problem. I'm sure everybody's heard about this one. This is a a Chinese book originally, which I did buy now, and I'm reading. It's really good so far. Uh, it's a sci-fi that came out on Netflix as well. Uh, March 21st, has a lot of, it says from the creators of Game of Thrones. I think it's the same, it's the people that ruined Game of Thrones, actually. Oh, uh, those are the, not the creators. I think that's a very creative way of using that word. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that, like, even if you have one guy that was part of the creation process, then it would technically work, but I, I uh, guess I, I believe it's the, the showrunners from Game of Thrones. I mean, to be fair, they were showrunners, we talked about this, and Game of Thrones was S-tier while they were showrunners. And then they just wanted to quit, but didn't. And they just like shit on the show and just ended it horribly, right? But anyway, that's another story. So three body problem, a sci-fi. Uh, there's an astrophysicist who sees her father beaten to death during a struggle session in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. She is conscripted by the military because of her scientific background and is sent to a secret military base in a remote region. Her decision at the base to respond to contact from an alien planet has implications for a group of scientists in present day, forcing them to face humanity's greatest threat. Sounds kind of generic. But yeah, I was just going to say, this is like every alien show I, ever. I, I or movie. understand why you would say that, but just trust me, it's not. It's extremely well made. Uh, and I think these guys are very good at making a show when the source material is strong. And this is maybe mm. the most famous modern day sci-fi in China. And I think, I'm pretty sure it's doing really well now in the translated version, which is apparently very well translated. And I have to say, I agree. Uh, but the show itself, very good. If you like shows that have really deep lore, uh, I would say this is probably up there for sci-fi. I also think you don't need to invent something new to make something successful, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, if this thematically is very similar to other movies or other shows you've seen, but the story and the, like, just, how to say, primarily for me, I would say the story. If the story is better, it, a story doesn't have to be very creative to be really good, right? Like, mm -hmm. in essence, a lot of movie plots and whatnot are alterations on themes and stuff that we've seen many times, but if it's really well executed, it can still be awesome. So I don't think it's a problem that this sounds familiar. Um, but obviously, if 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 it isn't good, then then it has nothing. Right? <laughs> it's not even creative. Yeah. But but if it is good, that's. I would say for me, fine. this is like an eight out of ten uh, for a first season. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, and again, I don't, I can't compare it to the book, but so far the book is very good. And I know that they, in terms of things they put in the first season, it's kind of, I was told it's kind of all over the place. So mm -hmm. I don't know how exactly that will translate when I read the book, but. Those are my three recommends for today's episode. Uh, okay. So first topic, Cinderin, of Dota is the Elite League. Yes. Which is occurring now. It is an online tournament for exactly $960,000. Couldn't quite get to the million, I guess. For legal reasons, it cannot be a million, apparently. Oh, I just realized you can't. Okay, we're bug testing here. Nice. Hold on a second. Love me... that. All right actually just not you're not gonna be able to see the right side that's unfortunate maybe we should put our faces on the left <laughs> anywho 
audio listeners rejoice. Yes. It's the same as always <laughs> for you. That is true. Uh, there's a lot of tier one teams at this tournament. And the reason I want, typically we don't talk about uh, online tournaments unless we're attending them. But this is mm -hmm. a lot of money. And I also wanted to ask you, because people are talking about the Swiss brackets, the Swiss system that they're using. Right. And I realize it's been so long since there's been a tournament that we've covered, maybe ever. I don't remember doing it. But I don't even remember what um, Swiss is, other than I, cheese and a country. I think we had one tournament like seven years ago or something that did Swiss, Swiss groups in Dota. That's the only time I remember. It was run and it wasn't run back. So you could argue this is like a breath of fresh air um, in that I can only think of one other tournament that ever did it. So it's very rare in our game. This is the standard in Counter-Strike. Um, I'll just I'll quickly explain how the format works and then we can talk about why it works in CS and why it might or might not be so good for Dota. So um, the way Swiss brackets work is that you essentially to qualify to the next stage you need to win three series before you lose three series okay simple enough okay. you start with a matchup against another team now let's say you're a 16 team swiss then eight teams will be one and zero and eight teams will be zero and one after that first best of three now all the one and zeros move upward in the bracket and mm. now they will play against other one zeros and all the zero ones go to the other end of the bracket and they will play against other zero ones. Okay. Now, in the next round, that means there's gonna be four series that is one zero versus one zero, and there's gonna be four zero four series that is zero one versus zero one. Now the winner of the top end of the bracket will now be two zero, and the losers will be one and one. And conversely on the bottom, the ones that are lose the zero one series will now be zero two, whereas the winners will be one and one. So you can imagine the bracket converges, right? The bottom winners and the top losers will now meet in the 1-1 one, one bracket. And the mm. two zeros, there's only now four teams left that have two and zero. Out of those four teams, two of them will win again. They will be 3-0. They will be qualified to the next stage with the best possible score of 3-0. Only two teams get that out of the 16. Now, the bracket plays on until everybody has either three losses or three wins. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Um, mm. And this cuts the teams in half. Mm. That's how this works. It's a really good system for Counter-Strike in, in that I think, first of all, the logistics in CS, the tournaments have a lot of teams, right? They, they have a long play-in with 24 teams first, and then they cut it down to 16, and then those 16 play Swiss to cut it down to 8. Uh, and then they do single a limb after. Um, in Dota, when you... Let's it, like the trade-off here is that the maximum amount of games a team gets to play before elimination is five, five series, right? So you get to play against a third of the other teams in the tournament if you go all five games. Um, in round robin, if you do two groups of eight, you get to play seven other teams, maybe just in two game series or even best ones. Um, so I would argue. In a system like Swiss, seeding becomes even more important uh, because what ends up happening is, depending on the road you take, right? It's pretty few series that are very important uh, to how you place. And the other thing is this, um, how to say? Yeah, it's just the amount of different matchups you can encounter is quite small. So, realistically speaking, if a team is 2-0 and zero after the first two rounds, it is quite unlikely they ever get to meet one of the 0-2 and two teams making a comeback, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like, possible storylines that kind of get shafted and that you don't get to play. But for, this, for the purpose of progressing eight teams, this is a pretty quick format that, has, that still generates quite a lot of games. Um, but one of the major downsides, in my opinion, is you could lose three series and just be out, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Compared to round robin, where you get to play a lot of other opponents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was a bit long-winded, but no, that's that the essence good. of it. And for in CS, what they do is the rounds until it's elimination or progression are BO ones usually. So the teams very quickly uh, get their first wins or losses, and 
if you did best of three for every series in CS in these Swiss rounds, they would take really long. That's not true. Um, why, why does everybody say that? Dota games are I longer. I think it's because, right, they are, but I think in CS what they do is they, I think they do fewer multi-streams, right? So if you do best of threes, you have to have multiple streams or this will take forever, right? Mm -hmm. There needs to be many games going on at once in these pools. And it's, it's the same in round robin. If you want to play best of threes in round robin, it just takes really, really long if you play one series at a time. So depending on what the norm is in the game, how many games you're supposed to be able to see on stream, yada, yada, then there's strengths and weaknesses to everything in, this, in these games. Um, I personally kind of like the Swiss format. I think it's very appealing. I think it makes every series very important. Um, I don't know if it's the best for Dota compared to CS. Because I would argue that team versus team matchups in Dota are more important than they are in Counter-Strike. And maybe that's just me being uninformed or, you know, just not skilled enough at the game to see that. Why I know you, that some teams are good on you, some maps. Why do you say that? Because I think... So in CS, if you're good on a map, then that's different than being good against another team in macro strategy, right? In Dota, I feel like more often than not, a big part of the strategy is about the draft and how you beat specific teams on how to say you could be okay let me try to rephrase this you could be a middle of the pack team but be really good against one of the good teams because your play style is awesome against them mm -hmm. that might also be the case in counter-strike but i feel like in cs it's a lot more about your map pool like we are good on these maps are we better than you versus in Dota, where it's like, our play style is very good against this archetype of team. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense to you? What I'm saying? Well, I mean, it makes sense because uh, D uh, D Dota is much deeper than Counter-Strike, so you're going to find that type of matchup to be right more prevalent, I guess. And therefore, if you play Swiss in Dota, you might be quote-unquote robbed of some wins against high-tier teams that you just never get to face. Right. Uh, and that could influence your placement. If you're eight, if eight teams advance in a round robin, winning against one of the top teams in the group is huge. Mm -hmm. That often will get you a fourth place. But in Swiss, you don't get a chance to play them if you didn't win round one, generally speaking. So, I don't know. That's one of the things, I think. Logistically, I don't know. But, like... I think this format is really cool, and I wish we tried it more, so I'm happy to see Elite League running it. I wonder what the teams think, right? That's the other side of it. Do, do the teams find it rewarding and I mean, fun to in play? In my experience, players don't like change, and every other tournament oh, has sure. been basically yeah. the same format, right? Right. I mean, I, I think as a spectator, it's cool to see different formats just to switch it up, just for the sake of switching it up. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that I would prefer this over the other one, though. Um, uh, but yeah, it is interesting. I know there's a lot, like, I know this is considered the first group stage, right? And then mm -hmm. the second group stage is going to be round robin. So then it gets back to what we're used to. And the playoffs are double the limb. So, and just the fact that the Swiss groups are best of threes versus Counter-Strike yeah. being best of ones, which leads into single limb everything. <laughs> it's yeah pretty crazy. Which is why I, I think certain players and certain teams making it, which we'll talk about when we talk about Counter Strike later, making it to like finals repeatedly is probably just based on that fact, maybe more impressive in CS than it is in Dota. I would say single limb is a different beast. You you can't fuck up, right? In Dota, we've seen many lower bracket comebacks. Yep. They just don't happen. <laughs> You're out if you lose round one of the playoffs. Um, yeah. I I wonder why Counter-Strike doesn't do double a limb. I feel like they haven't done it forever. Um, well, I think we'll get, we'll get to that. I think a lot okay. of it has to do with uh, Valve not keeping up with the times and not realizing, apparently, that they changed it to MR12 instead of whatever. We'll talk about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, okay, anything else yeah. on this tournament you want to talk about? Um, yeah, it was mainly about the format because the, the Swiss round isn't done yet. I believe the final teams to make second stage will happen today. There's three matchups left. Uh, I can tell you who has advanced. Obviously, this is a pretty stacked tournament, like you said. 
the three zero teams were Boom Esports and Entity, which I think is quite surprising to a lot of people that these two teams aced the Swiss round. Uh, three additional teams advanced are OG, PSG Quest, and Tundra. And then the teams playing to potentially advance today are Aurora, Blacklist, Heroic, Talon, Secret, and VP. Uh, of which three will be eliminated. And the eliminated teams are KEV, Nigma, Nouns, Nine Pandas, and Rest Farmers, which is a name that I've never seen before. But their logo is a shark with coins in its hand, a hat on, and an axe in the other hand. <laughs> uh, so a very nice logo. A hand sure. scan team. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's why they focus on the hands so much in the logo. There you go. Okay. So um, with this yeah. kind of format, it does feel like there's a lot of teams that are, I guess once they get three losses, they're just out. So there's no meaningless games, right? That's another benefit, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. That's true. Swiss eliminates the seeding or quote unquote unimportant games. Every game is mega important in, in Swiss. Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> very true. Okay. Uh, moving on to the only other topic we have to discuss in Dota. Quinn played against five heralds. <laughs> so this was a Jenkins stream special. Uh, he asked me to cast with him. Uh, it was 9 a.m., so I said no, of course. I'm not, mm. I'm not a fucking moron. I'm not going to get up at 9 a.m. Uh, yeah. So he solo Imagine cast. getting up for that for the podcast every week. Yeah, I mean, touche. It's 10 a.m., to touché. be fair. Hey, you, By the good. way, we, we, we went one year now without talking about daylight savings time which is great. Oh, yeah. Because for me, this is an hour earlier than normal, and it's way better. Holy shit. Way better. Anyway, back to the Heralds. You. So Jenkins thought it would be fun to create a show match where Quinn plays against five Heralds, and I think somebody mm -hmm. in here talked about, should have looked this up, what the rules were. I think he got to ban a few heroes, but then he ended up telling them what he was picking. Anyway, I guess the details aren't that important. Oh, this was more elaborate. Okay. I thought it was just... Yeah, so he ended up taking Bristle back, and he mm -hmm. played against a... <laughs> of course, Clinks. Clink, Snapfire, Puck, Primal Beast, and Vengeful Spirit. And needless to say, he won big time. The game ended... Let me see what the actual score was. It was 52 to 2. 52 to 2, and the second death he got was at the end, essentially, where he was fountain diving them. 52 yeah. to 2 in a 1 versus 5, and apparently they started out tri laning against him, <laughs> and that spelled their doom. Uh, so they had two solo lanes <laughs> and a tri lane against Quinn. Of course, Bristleback is a difficult hero, but this is a kind of a cool format. It's a. How high do you think, because he's ranked number one, how mm -hmm. high do you think he could have gone in terms of, could he beat five legends, for example? Um, well, I will start out saying, with all due respect, the Heralds picked really bad heroes against <laughs> Bristleback. So, uh, again, I don't know what the draft order was. Like you said, he an does he announce his hero and they get to counterpick? Because, I mean, obviously at, at this skill bracket, people aren't necessarily knowledgeable about interactions or what to what to counter with etc cetera, etc cetera. but um yeah that's the first problem how high could he go it's really hard for me to answer because i feel like even at even if you took five other heralds and you ran the experiment back i think they might draft way better and i think a huge part of this is being uncountered on the hero you play obviously he's going to be way better than them i think it doesn't really matter how they lane they're going to probably overall quote unquote lose the laning stage compared to expectations but so quinn apparently if, banned lion shaman bane nature's prophet and then I, this guy couldn't remember the fifth so he banned two hexes and teleport essentially yeah yeah okay um interesting yeah i i don't know how high can he go i think he can maybe what's the next bracket's guardian right yeah, well, we should mention Maybe. he did end the game in about 30, a little bit over 30 minutes. He had Boots of Travel mm -hmm. 2, Salt Kuros, uh, Bloodstone, Octarine, Moonshard, both consumed and in his inventory. Wind Waker, he had an SN, is that an SNK? Or SN yeah. SNK in his backpack. And, and the Shard. So 
does he start with 600 gold? I guess he does, right? He just starts with a normal amount of gold like any player would. And then... He um, might get more gold per second, though. Does he get passive gold? That was my question. Does he get the gold like he has teammates that are you DC? Know, if I had bothered to watch... I'm, I'm not going to watch any of Jenkins' content, of course. Like, why course. waste your time? If I had watched it, I would have learned that. But I didn't, so... Okay, so he got five times passive gold, right? There's um, Jenkins' face. Skip that. If he gets five times passive gold, I think he also beats Guardians. Enough of the time. I'm not going to say always, because this is so much about picks. Yeah. Um, well, let's even say it's a I really think, good pick for him in general. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's like, he picks a hero that will have a good matchup, guarantee, but there's five players. Right. Like, At what point would it really surprise you that he wins? Like, what's the threshold, do you uh, think? Obviously, there's a lot the of variables. After Guardian? Is that Archon or Legend? It's Archon, Archon, right? yeah. I think it would surprise me there. So Already. five Archons, you think, would be Yeah. Him. Okay. I think so. I'm sure Jenkins will do this again. I'd be interested to see. I mean, I think it would be best if they do it one by one, right? But mm -hmm. I think the issue is, like, the Bristleback, I don't, I don't know if the other team gets bans in this scenario, but that would be, that's a really good... 1v5 hero, right? Yeah, and if he runs it back, the other players, if they're invested in the series, they will have seen the matchup and they will think of counters better. Yeah. That, that's why this gets difficult, because I think there's a relatively small subset of heroes Quinn could pick to win a 1v5, and then it's going to get harder and harder as people draft better. I think for me, a big part of why I think it's going to get harder against Archons than against uh, Heralds isn't necessarily individual performance. I think it's just better drafting. Mm. It's going to be a big part of it. When you get to that range, people start knowing what's good against other heroes. In, in Herald, when you look at drafts, people just pick, oh, this hero is fun, or I know how to play this one, or, uh, you know? And mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit more meta-solving uh, further up the ladder, and obviously eclipses at, or peaks at Immortal, where people really counterpick to the absolute limit. Right. Um, but yeah, I think at Archon, people probably start having a, a pretty solid understanding of at least some heroes being good against some others. And if just like two or three of the players pick really good counters to Quinn's hero, that's probably enough, right? Just in this game, they picked zero. <laughs> so You'd think they get like three silver edges, maybe, <laughs> to try to yeah, deal with them. You, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's many, there's many ways of solving Bristle. This hero isn't even meta, you know, yeah. for a reason. But it's a really cool experiment, and it's very fun to see how people interact with it. I, their idea of trialing him, I think, is absolutely hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's what they should have done. I can't say for a fact that it was a bad idea. Let's but. see. They did have... I don't know if he bought it, but Primal gets Ags. That's a break. Is that the only break yeah. that they would have inherently? I think so. Yeah. There's very few inherently in the game. Uh, but yeah, that's. I think that's really cool idea. Not cool enough for me to watch it, mainly because Jenkins was in charge of it. Uh, if somebody yeah. else wants to take that up, then maybe I'll watch that and consume it. Yeah, if anybody wants to about. run Quinn versus five Guardians, <laughs> we will watch it. If you guys can organize it, <laughs> or if Jenkins wants to hold it at maybe noon PST, then I'll wake ah. up. I'll wake up for noon, but not before that. If it's morning, ain't happening. Is he still at your place, by the way? No. No. Okay. He left a week like, ago. Okay. He was there for like a few weeks, right? Or two two weeks? Uh, it might have been two weeks. Yeah. My God, he's two obsessed weeks, yeah. with this fucking pasta place. We would. Oh. We, we went so often. Like the way that it works is, I would get a pick of where we go to eat. He would get mm -hmm. a pick, and then Nikki would get a pick. And his and pick the same one every his time. His pick was always the same place. Oregano's. It's just a. It's, it's nice. It's a it's a good pasta place. It's good. Mm -hmm. Not like mind blowing. Every five, so thirty three percent of the days. Uh, and then we had a guest come, and they picked oregano's as well. It's just really bad luck on that one. I mean, knowing uh, knowing Jenkins, he might not even have thought it was that good. He just kept going there <laughs> just to fuck with you. Yeah, it's possible. Like, it wouldn't surprise me. It's like ah, food is just something you need you need to eat. So let's t pick the place that I get the most visceral reaction from Shannon with. He does you know? like his bits, that's true. That would he be He really bit. does. 
Oh, we never talked about the grubby thing, did we? That's a that's a mean? good story for another time. What? Did we talk about that in the podcast? Oh, that grubby. Oh my god, how did we not talk about that? I don't know. I it just crossed my mind. I don't think we ever talked All right, about that. Let me. Uh, but I think let me to type do it in justice, grubby we should here. Probably, yeah, we should do that next episode or something. Just next episode. Oh, do you do you know it well enough to just go yes, with it? Yes, of course. Okay, then you tell the story. Okay, let me just uh, copy. We got to do this properly. This beta test of this new format. Uh, let me move it over to the proper location. Zoom in on his face. So that, as you guys can see, is grubby. Okay. And <laughs> very good. <laughs> if if you guys aren't familiar with him, he's a an ex pro Warcraft three player. He played a lot of Starcraft two. Played some Heroes of the Storm, and of course he transitioned to Dota 2 as a streamer and was learning from the bottom up as a herald. Eventually got to Immortal in just a little bit over a year. And very positive guy, very positive. And of course Jenkins, not so much. Uh, Jenkins likes to, to, for those of you that don't understand what Jenkins is like, he's always on, as we call it. So is Slack's. Two of them are very similar in some ways where mm. you think that they're acting a certain way because there's a camera. That is not the case. I can tell you that right now. For me, I will probably put in a little bit more energy when I'm in front of a camera. Like I, I become mm. more dead inside, I guess, but everything else is probably the same. For you, it's identical because you look dead inside at all times anyway. That's me. I'm going off on tangent here. So Jenkins loves bits, as we call them. Yes. Uh, bits are just jokes, and most of the time they're just internal, not funny to literally anyone but him, but he'll still do it because he finds it funny. So mm -hmm. he thought it would be funny to, to screw around with Banana Slam Jamma. And BSJ, uh, one of his close friends, of course, always, this is the thing that impressed me about BSJ. He never gets mad <laughs> at any of the jokes that Jenkins pulls like as an example it's very patient uh when they had fart studios obviously he had bsj join and he somehow convinced bsj that they were all going to change their name to have fart in it on the official valve name to the point where it will show up in every game of dota 2 and bsj he i think he asked like are you sure everyone's doing this like that doesn't like doesn't really why, why can you change it later and jenkins is like of course and by the way, Jenkins has pulled so many pranks on him. It's just a shock to everyone that's around him that he falls for it still. Anything ever. I don't know. <laughs> so basically, he thing. tricked him into calling himself Fart SJ. And for literally, it's not, not just over, like a full year when he played Dota, his name was Fart SJ. Couldn't change it because of that. Why did he not, why did he not <laughs> double check with one of the other teammates? Uh, actually, I mean, I mean let me just, Maybe uh, Jenkins convinced all the other ones to be in on the bit. Let me just get Banana so Slam Jamma on the screen here. Sorry, we're beta testing this. Uh, this is a good part. Part SJ. Here. Uh, so this. Oh my god. Let me get this here. Copy image link. Yeah. So this, of course, is Banana Slam Jamma. Uh, this is this is from a skit, by the way. He doesn't generally look like this. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know why I brought this picture up on screen because I was done talking about BSJ. So back to Grubby. Here's BSJ, by the way. Okay, yeah. next. So back to Grubby. So Jenkins, so do you remember, for all of you guys that use Discord, they had a, like, of course, for years and years and years, if you wanted a specific name, you could just choose it. Like, there was no restrictions on name creation mm -hmm. at all because every name ended with hashtag and then number, some number. And the numbers are the ones that ended up being unique. Of course, right. not too long ago, they changed that. So if you wanted to have a specific name, like for Suns fan, I had to be first to do it. And of course, they would allow, like they ended up doing, like allowing you to do that in waves. I don't know how mm -hmm. they selected people, but I was lucky enough to get mine. Jenkins, of course, thought it would be funny to change his name to Banana Slam Jamma. Okay, just Banana Slam Jamma. And the funny thing is, BSJ didn't even realize this for many weeks because he just chose BSJ. He literally didn't even, <laughs> notice, <laughs> didn't even notice that he took it. So it wasn't even funny for anyone other than Jenkins because some other people might be tricked. So here comes Grubby, who's been on the screen for quite a while. We haven't really mentioned him in quite a while. But he comes into the picture now. He, of course, adds BS, Banana Slam Jamma, thinking it's him, messages him, and s tells him that he's been watching his stream. He's really been enjoying... Uh, 
you know, the content that he puts out. And Jenkins, thinking it's funny, pretends to be BSJ and like just pretends to know what Grubby's talking about. Like Grubby will mention something about the Lifestealer build that BSJ was talking about on his actual stream and correct him with some mechanics. And Jenkins would reply with, oh my God, thank you so much. I didn't know that. That's such a... Ben, you're so smart. I really appreciate that. It's really going to help me in the content for, of course, BSJ never finds out about this. So for a full year, Jenkins and Grubby have been having this relationship on Discord. But Jenkins knows that he's pretending to be BSJ. Grubby does not. He thinks he's talking to BSJ. And it wasn't until recently where Grubby was going to end up uh, going to some location in Europe, I believe, uh, where he was going to meet BSJ in person and he messaged him about something. And Jenkins replied... That's the only part I can't remember, actually. Jenkins replied with... Do you remember this part? I'm fucking up the story now. No? I think no, I don't think so. Yeah. Chat, help me finish the story. Oh, right. He was asking for something and Jenkins just said, Fuck you. Yeah. That was his reply. And then Grubby confronts bsj why did you say fuck you like i never talked to you on this <laughs> it's like hi i'm bsj nice to meet you <laughs> so that's the the jenkins and grubby slash bsj saga i don't know how that's possible to happen a full year and the oh, thing yeah, is yeah, yeah. that's right what's that no no somebody in your in your chat just wrote grubby was going to be late to a meetup Oh yeah. Right. So they were meant to meet, and then he wrote to Jenkins, thinking he was BSJ, and Jenkins just wrote "fuck you" for being late. <laughs> and then when he was like, "Why did you say fuck you?" I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> this is so fucking hysterical. Like, and of course, Grubby uh, can't understand what it's the normal reaction, a normal human being. Yeah. How could someone think that's funny? That's Jenkins. That's just his humor, you know? Okay. And so, the funny thing is, Jenkins told me about this like six months ago. I figured that, you know, he was either exaggerating or eventually found a conclusion like shortly after it began, but over a year. That's, that's pretty, pretty crazy. It was, it was quite fun to read the comments when this was posted on Reddit about this. It seemed like people were very polarized on something like this. Like, <laughs> A lot of the comments were like, dude, that's not fucking okay. You're really messing with him. He, you know, it's, it's really vile. And the other were like, this is fucking S tier prank. That's really fucking funny. Like, it was very, very different how people reacted to it. Um, I believe, which is the happy ending to the story. I think Grubby said something along the lines of it was hilarious, right? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure his response to finding out wasn't like disdain or anything. He just thought it was really well executed and funny. Maybe that was just his <laughs> official reaction. I, I don't. And I, I didn't hear anything about that. I saw that he made a I bit on I, his channel when he was talking about it. So he I'm, was. I'm pretty fun sure he at least embraced it and wasn't yeah, like yeah. super negative about it. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. That, that's the thing about something like this. I think the idea of this is really funny, but dragging it on for a year is ridiculous. Yeah, that's just Jenkins in a nutshell. Though. Dedication. I think way more people would be optimistic about or be positive about a prank like this if it lasted a week, <laughs> yeah. right? But doing it for a full year, I don't know how many interactions there's been, right? But mm. um, yeah, I, I, I want to commend Jenkins for the execution, of course. I mean, he's really committed to his shit when he does it, but what a, what a mess. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that was that's something. One. Wait, how did we get here? I don't remember. Oh, it was just the five heralds thing, right? Yeah. I think. Yeah, true. Okay. Okay. Next topic, ability arena. Boy, oh boy, we have an oh. interesting uh, interesting announcement. It's been a long time coming. I know that every other, for some reason, every other custom game is allowed to have monetization, apparently, except for us. So we will be coming back with a new way to actually be able to run the game and pay people and ourselves something. So basically the TLDR is we've come to a partnership with Gaiman.gg and it essentially will allow us to do a couple things. Number one, 
is make everything free. So we already took out the store and everything, but nobody could really access mm. plus. Nobody could access a lot of the gods in the game because there's no way to get like the in-game gold or anything. Uh, so what's happening is you can download, this is optional mm. if you want, uh, the gaming.gg app, and you just basically hook it up to your account, uh, tie it with your Steam or whatever, and we'll be able to see that you've done that, and you will unlock every single god for free. Half the gods are free now, so that's also different. So half of them will be free. The other half will be uh, if you hook up your account, which of course is free, and you get all the old plus stuff, which is not just the extra gods now, but you get the favorite spells. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second, the monthly tournaments. Uh, unlock, I mean, you can just read it. There's a bunch of stuff you get. You can mute, very important, mute sound effects if somebody's clicking too much on your, your arena. And then the second thing that's allowing us to do, basically they're partnering with us to fund the esports scene, if you want to call it that. Uh, so every month we'll be holding a tournament like we did before, a $1,000 prize pool, uh, which Jenkins and I will be casting. So Ability Arena is back and it allows us to continue to develop the game. We're not going to have like crazy battle passes or anything anymore because, again, <laughs> we can't do that really. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will be balancing the game. We will be coming out with new patches to, to fix things. And yeah, so overall, this has been a long time coming and excited to be able to have people play Ability Arena again. So this is going to happen later today. So it's kind of, I didn't want to wait till next week because that was kind of weird. But uh, in like as of this recording, probably in the next like 12 hours or so, it will be live. So essentially, you just go onto the website, you go to the plus section, and you connect your account. Pretty easy peasy. Um, <clears throat> what was I gonna say? Are you gonna is Ability Arena kind of like a test bed for some of the ideas you have for Relic Arena that you're gonna like see how people interact with them and then. Yeah, so it systems and ideas that are good make it into your your standalone. Yeah, game, it's a case or? by case, but yeah, there's definitely going to be some relation with like gods, so mm -hmm. we can test things out to see what people like. Like, there's already instances of gods in the past that we we like the concept for, but they didn't really they weren't really popular. So we're trying to kind of repackage them in a way that makes them more interesting, the people to like them, because I think conceptually a lot of them were fine. Uh, mm -hmm. We just need to find the kind of that special sauce, if you want to call it that. And then right. for, I think the bigger thing is maybe in the future we try new mechanics that we do want to try in Relic Arena. But mm -hmm. then again, we're at a point in Relic Arena where we can just test that stuff ourselves now. So it uh, kind of remains to be seen, but right. we'll see. Either way, this allows yeah, us to the fund thing, the game. So happy. The about thing that. about Ability Arena is currently in its current state, right? It will have way more reach because you're not giving access to very many people to Relic Arena. So if you had like an idea and you needed a sample, yeah, I figured that Ability Arena you could get a lot of more people interacting with it, see if they understand how you're meant to use it, and if if it works the way you're expecting. So yep, you're right. I thought that was interesting. That's an how to say that's an avenue that a lot of game devs don't have, right? You have the luxury that you're making a game that you have essentially a, a different version of, so you can test it in that one. Um, mostly games get tested in-house during the development and you don't have thousands of people that can just demo your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Yep, that's true. <clears throat> that you can do that. So yeah, later today, uh, abilityarena.com will have that available. Like I said, as of right now in this recording, this live recording, uh, it's not quite out yet, but later today. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to that. And with that, we can move on to the Counter-Strike 2 PGL Major in Copenhagen, Cinderman. You got to go for oh, a day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about how the tournament went in terms of results, then we can talk about your experience afterwards, okay? Yep. So this had the Swiss format, of course. A lot of very good teams. Uh, the Swiss, I mean, we can skip that. We can just go to the playoff stage since this isn't Dota, we need to get too specific. So mm -hmm. the thing that I thought was crazy, Cinderin, is that FaZe, Team Spirit, and vitality were on the same side of the bracket in the playoffs. That is insane. Yeah. So, for those that don't remember, we talked about Team Spirit a while back with Donk having the literal best performance in Counter Strike history. Uh, in the what tournament was that? Where they three zero trashed Face Clan in the finals, literally made Kerrigan cry. 
<laughs> but they end up facing off against them again, but this time in the first round of the quarterfinals of playoffs, and FaZe Clan take them out 2-1. And then Vitality, close, yeah, it was super close. Could have gone either way. Vitality end up meeting them. Vitality is the team with um, Zai, Zai, is it Zaiwu? Yeah, yeah, Zaiwu, who is the guy that I was talking about being maybe the best player I've ever seen on every gun. Mm -hmm. Just crazy. They end up losing to Phase Clan as well. So Phase Clan, the the thing with them is they're making. Every single grand finals at every tournament in Counter Strike 2, basically, it is absurd how consistent they are. And again, this is single a limb, as we talked about, yeah, which makes it more impressive than when this happens in Dota. And even yeah. in Dota, it doesn't even happen that often, right? Like, people have runs like this is equivalent to like the Game and Gladiators run, I guess, from last year, except I would you could argue it's more impressive. Of the single I guess one. you could also argue that I don't know if I would say this is harder to do in CS than in Dota because I think in Dota the meta sh uh, the meta shakeups are way more massive, right? When there's a patch, mm. the game in Dota the game changes way more than CS does. So staying on top means that you're adapting very well to new circumstances. You have deep hero pools, you have creative players. In CS, mm. it's kind of like if you have a really high level and your players are hitting shots and you're executing strategies. You don't need, I don't, again, maybe this is just me being naive and not understanding the game at the highest level, but I figure the adaptations you make from, like, the depth of strategy is not similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way in which you stay on top is hitting good shots, using good utility, and then there is some variation in what strategies you run, how you play the map, and what you prioritize, what players you try to counter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's definitely a lot of strategy, um, but I, I think... I I don't know what I would compare. Like, let's say a patch drops in Dota. What that would compare to in CS? I just don't think it happens, right? Mm -hmm. It's like um, I mean, it's it's a good. Imagine point. you have imagine you have players that are really good on three different guns, and then you go to a tournament, and those three guns get nerfed, and now the other players are better comparatively. Mm -hmm. Like that's how it would be, but it doesn't really work. Yeah, like I think that, the the so. main issue is you, you can't really compare the two games because there's just so many yeah. differences. Uh, I think you could argue either way. I understand your point. Uh. I find the scouting of teams being so interesting. Like FaZe Clan, like I said, they got 3 0 against Team Spirit last time they faced off, and then it was a really close 2-1 because mm -hmm. they were able to look at those replays and see the tendencies of player-specific play and right. be able to counter that in some way that's actually meaningful. So anyway, FaZe Clan gets to the finals again, and they face yep. off against Na'Vi, who this is the big story of the tournament. This is a team that had Simple, which is considered to be the greatest player of all time, yeah. And they beat FaZe Clan 2-1. And none of the game... I guess game one was relatively close. It was a 13-9. The next two, not close. So Na'Vi wins game one in a relatively close 13-9, like I said. Uh, FaZe Clan takes game two on Mirage, 13-2, mega stomp. And then mm -hmm. Na'Vi takes it on Inferno, 13-3. So the last two games were pretty stompy. Uh, but here's and Na'Vi, of course, holding the trophy. Of course, about simple. I don't know if you did not men mention this on purpose. He was on the bench. He didn't play. Well, it's because he got. He's going to get bought out. I think is the. I think yeah, was, so was he on Falcons temporarily or something? I think yeah, he did like some short stint with them or whatever. I, I actually don't know what the exact state of this is, but yeah, he he is. Um, he took a break for a while, and then he was announced to do that one month stand-in or whatever for another org and i think now he's just back to being con contracted with navi but not playing currently and i think he mm -hmm. wants to play again so we'll see what ends up happening like some people are theorizing he's going to be put back on the main roster some people are theorizing like you said he's going to be sold a lot of the times you don't want to change a winning team right and if he's gonna slot into this team i think depending on who we re would replace the dynamic would be really really different and so let me I have two questions like to ask. It's not about having the best players. It's about having the best team. Well, that's so. the thing. So two things. One's related to Navi. One's related to this tournament format. So not that this is really that important of a discussion because the whole greatest of all time thing. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. 10 years of CSGO, I basically didn't play or watch, right? So there's a huge mm -hmm. gap of knowledge that I just don't have. Everything before right. that, I do. Everything I knew beforehand, of course, a lot of it is outdated and all that. So I never really got to see Simple play in his prime on a consistent basis. Obviously, I know he's mm -hmm. really good. Considered to be the greatest of all time, and it seems to be unanimous, at a certain point at least, 
I feel like this, I would think, changes things pretty drastically. You can't take the greatest player of all time off of a team and they win a tournament, a major. There's no way you can be considered greatest of all time. I feel like this actually hurts him uh, um, in terms of like his, what's the word? His uh, legacy? Yeah, his legacy. So I'm just I mean, trying to, I compare this to more like in like NBA type thing. Like if Michael Jordan gets mm -hmm. taken off a team, that team doesn't make the playoffs, you know? That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I think, so again, this, this is almost, this is another comparison, right? We talked about Dota versus CS. I think if you compare CS to basketball and the impact of swapping out one player, I think there's a quite significant difference to what a star player will do in basketball and what a star player will do in Counter-Strike, right? And this is no disrespect to the absolutely insane players that there are. But I think the jump from losing Michael Jordan on a basketball team to the jump of losing Simple on a Counter-Strike team, getting replaced by really good players, I think it's different. You know what I mean? It's like, different in the fact that there's not like all these inherent rules attached to like contracts and salary cap situation, like a draft, for example. Like all of this stuff is what makes there to be parity in the NBA as opposed to if they have the money... In Counter Strike, you can basically buy any player, <laughs> right? Right. That's quite a big difference. So it's not obviously a one to one, but I just found it to be an interesting talking point. I also think it's maybe a little bit of an oversimplification of what, no pun intended, of what actually happened here, because out of the Navi roster now, it's not like they swapped Simple out for another player and then won. The team is rebuilt entirely. Yeah, he hasn't played with them for quite left, a while. The only player that's left from the Navi that he won with is Bit. Um, all the other players on the team are new. This is an international roster. And I mean, the, the scene has changed quite a bit, right, in the last year. Um, but a lot of the teams that they're playing against at the absolute top level are the same. Like FaZe, I think, changed one player. Vitality moved some pieces around as well. Um, G2 are largely the same as well. I think there's been like a little bit of movements here and there, but nothing. Like Navi's, I think, among the top teams is like the most drastic one probably together with Mouse Sports, which I don't know if you would consider Mouse even in that discussion because they, it's a relatively recent thing that they're this good. Um, but yeah, it's, I think overall the biggest story that the community and CS is focusing on with this team is Alexi B, uh, the captain of Navi who's from Finland, who mm. played for a lot of different teams and just didn't really find great success. has been kicked from one or two previous teams that he once he was removed from did very poorly comparatively uh and he just never really got that big win yet um and this was obviously extremely huge for him um and there was even a post tournament i think it was wonderful talking about it on his stream i saw a clip that he was super happy to win but he was even happier for alexi because he really felt like you know that guy deserved it and put so much time and effort into and had so many projects not work out the way they could have um so that that to me is like the biggest story of this and obviously the finnish fans are elated that he finally did it so that's really cool i think this this was kind of a this was an underdog story i don't think a lot of people had navi even make top four so you know this was uh yeah it was a really an exceptional fun run to watch uh yeah. one more question about this tournament and then we can talk about your experience the best of or the grand finals were a best of three. Yeah. So I believe a lot of the tournaments with CS2 have been best of five. This is an official major. So Valve sanctioned yeah. essentially, which I assume that's the reason it's best of three. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I've, I've raged. You, you remember that time I raged about CS2? I'm not going to go that hand mm -hmm. this time. I think okay. Valve are really dropping the ball. I think they genuinely are doing such a shit job with counter-strike right now and it doesn't mean that the games weren't good it doesn't mean that the game can't be good i just think there's so many issues right now and a very mm -hmm. simple thing like you could argue that you know some gameplay mechanic needs to be like the tick rate thing like mm -hmm. i rage about that all the time the sub tick system being complete garbage and you can argue that it's a lot of work to fix this one changing it from a best of three to a best of five from Val's perspective, is literally no work at all other than a message to PGL. Mm -hmm. This is MR12. You've had a full year knowing that this game will be MR12. 
and you still don't make the grand finals best of five. It's just a fucking shame. Like this, it's a best of three and there's mm -hmm. no, this is single limb. So it's not like there's a series before it. There's just yeah, a whole true. lot of talking and lead up and then a best of three. A lot, like if it was a 2-0, it would be even worse, obviously. But mm -hmm. I think there's just no fucking excuse anymore with yeah, the best of three versus it's best a, of five. It's a real head scratcher for me too. Because like you could make an argument in the past with MR16 that, to, for those listening who aren't familiar with it, it's 15. the... Oh, sorry, MR15. It's the number of max rounds on either team. That's why it's called MR. So the, in the old system, the way you won a map was that you were first to 16. Now it's first to 13. And that makes the game a lot shorter. Um, but they haven't adjusted the finals length and they haven't adjusted the format, right? It's the same. It's the same amount of games in the Swiss and it's the same amount of games in the playoffs. Uh, and I 100% agree. At the very least, the finals should be best of five because the individual map is shorter. A 2-0 blowout in a finals of a major could have lasted an hour and 15 minutes of game time. Yep. Right? Like, that's crazy. Imagine that in a Dota best of five finals. Like, that's just impossible. Uh, even a Dota best of three finals, it's also it's not impossible, but it's very unlikely as well that the games are that fast. Mm. Um, and the nature of the games is different too, right? So I... Yeah, I don't understand why this wasn't best of five. I personally think they should have even... I think they did some best of five back in MR uh, in MR15. And the concern was that they went too long sometimes. Um, I'd be curious to see what a lot of like games a match to go of, really long. How, I, I wonder how that would compare to Dota, like when it was MR15. Yeah, because like the, the average game time in Dota, I think... Let's, let's say now, generously speaking, let's say the average game time is like 40, 45 minutes. How long is an MR12 match? Probably around the same, maybe a bit longer, I guess, on average. I didn't time it. I mean, yeah. does it say here? So, I mean, maybe the concern is, like, let's say you do BO5 and it goes to five games and the games are long on top of it, then logistically it becomes a concern, but then you have to start the finals earlier. I still think, like you said, the final stay is one match. Mm. So it, it has to be best of five when there's no lead-in. I think if you had a, if you had to do a BO3 before and that one goes long and then this would be five games and blah, blah, blah then maybe it's an issue. I don't know. If Dota can do best of three and the best of five, I don't see an issue. Right. Um, and then on top yeah, of that, I, I just needed to get it out of my system because I talked, I think I, the last time I talked about CS, like I said, I raged about a lot of the stuff that Valve needed to fix. I don't know if I mentioned this one, but it's still prevalent. Even the pros are annoyed that you change it to MR12 and you don't change the economy at all. So like right. CT side, you're just poor all the time. More save rounds, less action. Like what's the fucking deal here? Like you had a teams year have, to do this. I think the teams have adjusted a bit because effectively what ends up happening is that the meta evolves, right? And it, it feels like there's more force buys because with the limited amount of rounds, it's so important to do a dent in the enemy economy. Well, it's a combination. I actually there. think I, I, so. I'm not an expert on this. I would think there's more. I think it ends up evening out to be the same in terms of money mm -hmm. spent, probably because it's more force rounds and also more saves. Like there's a lot of two v three situations. They don't even bother trying. Right. There's a lot yeah, of saves. That's true. It yeah. is absurd. If that's what you meant by saving, I agree. There's a lot of retakes that aren't even attempted because the risk reward is is too harsh. Um, yeah. I think this is one of the things that will be changed over time. Uh, I'm very, I personally too am surprised that when they went MR12, they didn't at least change something with the mm. economy, at least make some meaningful tweaks, but it doesn't seem like they did very much. And uh, yeah, this BO5. So, okay, um, let's quickly talk about my experience with this. So this was, this was actually, funnily enough, this was a quite unique experience for me in the perspective of being a fan, right? So when we go to events, we go to multiple Dota events a year. Uh, many of the times they have a crowd and we are on the other side. And this time I got the authentic experience of being a fan with a GA ticket. No, I didn't have like any special treatment of anything of the kind. We just, we were just four dudes going together to watch them Counter-Strike. So we had the full experience of just getting through, finding seats, people claiming seats. The place that we went to being overcrowded, so we had to move. Then going somewhere where we apparently weren't allowed to sit, so guards were coming over and we had to leave. <laughs> and, you know, all this stuff. 
and the expensive arena food and drinks and you know the whole shebang and <laughs> the beer was fucking overpriced you know all this stuff so you get to see the other side uh i think i was curious going to an event like this how many fan interactions i would have and i think in the arena only one or two people uh came over to either said hey or you know i i like what you do with dota etc so it was very it was very authentic for the most part um so that was a fun experience to have you um, went for one day right yeah we only went one of the days um and that was that was planned long well in advance that mm. we were just going to go one day it was like we're going to go to copenhagen to have a weekend together and cs is one of the things we will do and that was the the day one what your friends were cs players they play the game or no yeah we play the game uh, all of us are very casual right um and i think yeah the three f friends i was there with are all better than me i think because i'm very bad but um oh. yeah they're all right they're nothing special they don't play like face it or anything like that they just play i think mm -hmm. we just play matchmaking once in a while and have fun um so but yeah for them it was a cool experience as well right because they hadn't been to an arena uh, esport event before so mm -hmm. for them this was also part of the appeal was just to see what is it like to watch esports live um and how was the arena since some... that's where ti will be right right so that was one of my secondary things with this was okay let's see what the the arena setup is like let's try to envision how ti will look here um i think some of the ways that they did this major i think there could be made some clear improvements on for ti but i also think there will for budget reasons i think considering the level that ti generally is the level of care and attention to detail that ti has in the arena organization i think i think TL will be run better than this in terms of the just budget wise i just think you have you have more money you can do more shit, right um so i think i think that will be better one of the one of the experiences we had which i found to be interesting is uh, acoustics so I don't know how much time you want to spend on this, but if so, you're sitting... Oh, sorry, before you get into this, why do they have more budget mm -hmm. with TI? It's Valve for both. Valve PGL. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure the amount of money that goes into TI eclipses this, right? Why? I mean, m maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm just pretty convinced that the... Like, just judging from history of... You know, if you look at something like the TI Finals Day with like live orchestra, with the way the stage is set, the way mm -hmm. the arena is used. I think the amount of cameras they have, the, the way they use talent, I just, I cannot imagine that not being way more expensive than this. Okay. Um, I, maybe I'm wrong. I just, I think it's an allocation of resources thing um, that Valve probably have the perspective that TI is like the, you know, it's the Super Bowl of esports. So mm -hmm. I think they just have a different perspective on how much they use on it. But who knows? Anyway, um, I think in the arena, I like the arena itself. I think it's very, uh, I think the design of it is cool. Now, what we had for the major was we had uh, the back wall was the screen and the teams were in front of that. And then the audience are sitting, there was premium seating on the floor level. And then the rest of the audience is sitting around the rim. I don't know if that's what it's technically called in an arena, but whatever. Uh, around that periphery and we were we did not have the premium tickets like i said so we were just sitting around the rim and what ends up happening with sound is all the fans are cheering toward the screen right so the sound is traveling in one direction when people cheer and that means the people that experience most of the hype are the people on the floor level because mm -hmm. all the sound is traveling toward them from the stands right uh, for the people around the rim there's not as much cheering because it's going away from them Usually a TI, if you remember what the stage setups are for TI, we have the teams in the center of the arena, and then there's screens in four directions, and the fans are all the way around. So the fans are cheering toward each other, and it makes a really big difference for how the... the how to say? The vibe in the arena is more intense for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. whereas for this, I think the people getting <clears throat> that experience are mainly on the floor level. So I hope for TI that Valve are still going to stick to this screens in the center idea uh and teams in the center rather than using the floor level for premium tickets um well, like based on where the really screens cool. were i assume it wouldn't work for dota anyway right because things are so much smaller um i think if they blow things up and they use that screen maybe slightly bigger i think it could work but i just i think the having it in the center would be would just flat out be preferable i think um mm. 
Because it is a concern when you use one back wall that you want to have info for KDAs, you want to have the minimap, you want to have, you know, whatever it is. In CS, the UI is a little bit more minimal in what you need to show uh, for the audience to be able to follow the game. So yeah. it's like KDAs, utility, <laughs> and player cams. There's no, you don't need to show the minimap as much. It's not as well. By the way, they had the player cam so. like on the bottom middle, and I was really, not even the bottom. I, mm. I felt like it was blocking a good amount of the view. And I'm like, nobody's complaining about this. This feels like it's really yeah. intrusive to me, but. No. Yeah. So experience was good other than the price of the food, huh? <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it, it was fun. Uh, and we went to watch it. And I think um, my friends had a good time too. And obviously it's, I, I think with something like this, it really makes a big difference who you're with, right? Like, it, like any social thing you do. So a mm -hmm. uh, good company will elevate things for sure. Uh, but it, it was very fun to try to be from the other side because I don't know if I've ever gone to an event for fun in esports before i don't think so it's <clears> always <throat> been either i'm a player or i'm a talent at the event uh oh actually that's not true i've been to one i think i went to one tournament where i was helping susie with the cosplay competition so mm -hmm. i was not talented at that one but that's also a different experience right because then you're with the cosplayer so you're backstage you're with people you know etc there that are working the event mm -hmm. so this was the first like authentic i have a ticket i'm gonna go and watch this event mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool to see things from the different it gives you some perspective on things right what the fans experience yeah. and what that's like so i'm that guessing was, that was very cool. you weren't there for the event that happened <laughs> i was you wait you're Actually. kidding no. Okay, give us the story because there was no I couldn't find any footage cuz PGL mm -hmm. never showed the the stage. It wasn't when shown this on happened. stream. Yeah. Okay, yeah. give so, it to us. What Shannon is alluding to here is there um there was an event during uh which game was it? It was the second series of the first day. G2 uh, versus or, sorry, somebody. Yeah. Yeah, it was I think it, who were they playing? Fuck. I actually forgot who G2 played in that series. Let me just quickly check. Uh, it would have been G2 mouse? versus Mouse. Yes, correct, I think. Um, what happened was that... So apparently... So G2 has a, a partnership with some sort of casino, I think, or online betting thing. And another online betting site was publicly accusing them for uh, scamming their users and for advertising to minors. Um, which is obviously extremely despicable within this space. And what they did was, I'm not going to name the sites, whatever, but they had effectively made like a semi, some sort of call to arms for fans to protest during the series against G2's partnership with this site. Mm. So effectively, there was a protest of betting site versus other betting site interrupting the game. Um, and you what have was to imagine. the protest exactly? So the protest. <laughs> the, the, the footage is pretty scuffed, right? Because effectively some people running, they're rushing up on the stage and then they get tackled. Mm. So I don't know what they wanted to do. If they were going to like stand there and yell shit or if they were going to wave flags or whatever. Uh, how many people would you oh, say? How many people got on stage? I don't know, like five maybe? I'm, I'm oh, not sure. Oh, okay. I was ex I, <laughs> just by the sound of it. It sounded like 20 people or something. I, it could be. Like, we were very far up, and it happened very fast, and it's kind of hard to see. And the footage that I've seen from people filming it or whatever are also very inconclusive, I think, with, with how big the protest was. Maybe it was more. Maybe it was, like, 20, like you said. But, Chad is saying okay, so that in they essence, broke... The problem, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, in essence, the problem here is that, like I talked about with the premium seating on the floor level, right? If you imagine the front premium seats are only a few meters away from the stage and there was no fence. Mm. So people could actually just get up and run on the stage <clears throat> very quickly before the guards could react. And so what happened here was uh, some people rushed on stage. This was the, you know, this was a protest against the site. You could argue whether or not that was something you should protest against. And if it should be done in this way is definitely what you should argue against. But um, the guards, I think, did a pretty good job in handling the situation, but obviously after this happened, they put up a fence. My question is, why wasn't there a fence to begin with? Mm. If you're going to have the audience this close to the stage at any concert, right, there's going to be some sort of either, there's either going to be people standing blocking you from getting on stage to begin with, or it's just going to be fenced off. Um, at TI, it's a different story, because like at TI, for example, you'll have, 
I think we have both, right? I think both there's some sort of fence around the arena, but also there's guards around the perimeter. And if somebody were to run on stage, the distance to the teams and to the center of attention is really far. Like mm -hmm. if you make it onto stage, you still need to get to the, the center of the stage, which is quite far. Here, literally, you jump out of your seat, you rush the stage, you're there. Um, so I, I think this was a bit of a blunder uh, from a security standpoint. They handled it well. Nobody was hurt. Um, and obviously, there's a very, however you want to call this, either funny or <laughs> disastrous moment of one of the people rushing the stage got tackled into the trophy, and it broke. <laughs> oh, I thought, um, I, th I, yeah, I was reading the chat. I thought that they broke it on purpose. <laughs> just I'm, pr the tackle. I'm pretty sure. So this is the one thing I think I saw was one of them got tackled and fell over into the trophy. <laughs> Oh I think so. I don't think it was so part of the protest the to break the trophy. The trophy that they're holding in this picture, I think, is 3D mm -hmm. printed. That's why it looks so cheap. This is yep. not the actual think, trophy, right? I think they had to do a last-minute replica. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, this... So... Uh, that's so it, it also wouldn't make sense, right? I, I think if you're considering what they're protesting against, they were protesting against one of the teams. There's like... You have no motivation to break the trophy then. Mm. Unless you're like, oh, G2 will win this tournament, so we're going to break the fucking trophy, right? right. <laughs> Which didn't happen anyway. So yeah, I mean, this, this whole thing was... Uh, effectively, they interrupted play. The teams and the ta talent went backstage. It went to a pause screen. They set up the fences. They came back, and the rest of the night proceeded as normal. Yeah, so and on like... stream, they never even mentioned what happened, at, I think, at any point. They, no. The, the camera was always in-game. The casters, mm -hmm. they just stopped speaking, basically. Right. It was actually really I think strange when they came, to experience for online. When they, yeah, when they talked about it on the panel as well, I don't think they specified exactly what happened, just that there they were was... They were very vague, yeah. They were vague, and they were talking about safety, right? Mm. So people were like, oh, shit, what happened? But from what I could tell from everything I've seen and heard, it was people running on stage wanting to protest against this betting site. They got tackled. There were, as far as I understand, no weapons involved of any kind. It was just people. Right. And I, I heard that they, shit. that PGL so. and the security were tipped off beforehand, which is why they were prepared to tackle so fast. Yeah. Supposedly. I, yeah. In that case, I feel like there should have been fencing. Yeah. Right. If, if you're anticipating this as a real risk, don't let them reach the stage, would be my two cents. Mm -hmm. Like, I understand, you know, it does something for the aesthetic that there's a fence at the front, but at the same time, you know, you got to have the players and the talent safety in mind in these situations. So I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, that was that. So that was an experience. It delayed the night by half an hour um, mm. in that series. Um, yeah. And I. And G2 oh, ended yeah, up winning that series a, anyway. Right. As a follow up to this, uh, the site that was making this protest happen had an event coming up and all the teams uh as, or at least many of them pulled out of that tournament oh, so now really? they lost their tournament as oh, well wow. yeah um mm. so that to clarify the the organizers off the protest not the ones that were being protested against it backfired on them mm -hmm. because of the way they orchestrated this protest people didn't want to participate in their tournament uh I think, I mean, it's obvious from my perspective, it's admirable to protest or complain about, you know, uh, if, if betting sites are being scammy or if they're, they're targeting minors, neither of these should ever happen. So I think their cause might have been fine, but the way this was pulled off was probably not the way you should have gone about it, right? Honestly, the most um, effective way, you know, how they have the camera going on the audience, just have 10 people scattered among the audience, write something, mm -hmm. like bait them into showing you, and then you show some message that's like, you know. Yeah. For your cause, like that is the. You rem you remind like, me of one of my favorite clips of all time in esports. I don't know if I've told you about this. It's actually from a Counter Strike tournament. It's this twelve-year-old kid who's sitting with a sign, and I think it says like "Go Astralis" or something. And then the camera cuts to him, and he flips his card over and says, "I fucked your mom." And then instantly, <laughs> production just instantly cuts away. They're like, "Red alert! What the fuck?" It's so funny. It's like that stereotype of that, you know, of the. Pre-teen Call of Duty player. Yeah. Just, you just imagine him in voice chat. God, that I wish I had seen that. That's oh my amazing. god, it was pristine. I love shit like that. I was laughing my ass off. So good. Um, but yeah, that was that. Um, that was the experience. Uh, we only went one day. Then we watched some of the games uh, remotely, like you. Just so. Mm. Um, right, very cool. But yeah, aside from that drama, um, 
if you can call it that. I think it was a it was a good tournament, right? Mm. So, and I think PGL got a lot of props uh, for how it was run as well. So, did they? Because they the, announced the stream went another... offline a few times when I was watching, <laughs> and people were raging. But... I see. Okay. Well, it's just it's just what I read that because uh, both in Dota and CS PGL have got some flack for. You know, the yeah, I think the, the consensus whatnot, was it wasn't like a disaster, but the other right. tournament organizers do a better job on average. So I think PGL, right. they announced a bunch of tournaments that they're going to be doing for CS in the future. And they're like, well, they're going to have to step up their game a bit to match everybody else. So we'll see. Yeah. But it wasn't like, I don't think it was disastrous or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that How's does that? it uh, for this episode. We'll save that last topic, which is open AI related, of course. We always end mm -hmm. with AI. Save that for yes. next week, Cinderin. All uh, good. So, oh shit, I zoomed in on the horse. Sorry for that jump scare. Uh, Suns fan and Cinderin, thanking you all for watching as always. If you have any suggestions on this new format, uh, it's not really the visual format, whatever the fuck you want to mm -hmm. call it, the visual aids, uh, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Peace! Bye-bye! We say things that don't mean anything Subscribe! But thanks for listening